everyone. Thank you for coming today. So as Matt said, I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my ongoing dissertation research on the evolution and ecology of steelhead and rainbow trout. Um, so I'm going to start broadly thinking about partial migration in fishes. And so partial migration is a, is a phenomenon in which migratory, not all individuals of a species that expresses migration, actually express that migration. So that means a given population of a migratory species can be comprised of both resident and migratory individuals. Um, and partial migration is actually quite common among a diversity of fishes that we might traditionally think of as just migratory. Um, and we know that migration is often phenotypically plastic, um, and ongoing trade-offs include individual growth and predation risk. Um, and on the bottom here are some pictures of um, family fishes that express partial migration. Um, and another thing to note is that mar migration strategy is often linked to body size. Um, and then looking more specifically at partial migration in salmonids, we know that migration has genetic underpinnings, but there is a lot of evidence that suggests that environmental variation can be really important in determining an individual's decision about whether they will migrate or not, especially in these partially migratory populations. Um, and some of these examples come from situations where offspring expect, express a different life history from their individuals. Um, we also know that in Salmonids, migration, again, is really often linked to body size, and here we often think of it as a threshold trait. So once individuals reach a certain body size, they will undertake that migration or not. Um, and also, thinking very broadly, migration often has consequences for nutrient transfer between ecosystems. And in Salmonids, that's often in between um, those carcasses that we find in the stream and then the nearby terrestrial areas. And so we've seen the transfer of that marine carbon from those carcasses um, up through the leaves of those nearby riparian areas. And that's just one example of the ways in which migration can be important for these transfer of nutrients between ecosystems. Um, however, we do have a couple of outstanding questions for par partial migration in salmonids, and these are some of the questions that I'm working to address with my current research. And so one of these questions is, how are, what are the geographical features that determine the spatial distribution of resident and migratory individuals in populations where they coexist? Um, and the second question is, what are the consequences for this life history zonation um, in the resident habitat? So beyond thinking of just how nutrients are transferred um, between nutrients, but also within the resident habitat, how is that ecology, and here I'll be thinking more specifically about stream ecology affected by the presence of migratory or resident individuals. Um, so first I'm going to talk about how we genotypes of migratory versus resident individuals are distributed within a stream. Um, so the partially migratory species of interest here is steelhead and rainbow trout. So steelhead are, um, of course, the anadromous fish, so they undertake a migration to the ocean for feeding and rearing, and then they return to freshwater systems to breed. Um, and then on the other hand, on the other extreme, we have these resident rainbow trout that can complete their entire life history within single streams. Um, and it's worth mentioning that omegas have a huge diversity of life history strategies, but today I'm going to be breaking that, dividing those into two divergent life histories, and those are the ones that migrate to the ocean and those are the, versus the ones that don't, so the steelhead and the rainbow trout. Um, and it's actually quite common in coastal streams in California to find both steelhead and rainbow trout in a single system. And one of the places where these migratory and resonant fish co-occur is in tributaries to the South Fork Eel River. So the Eel River is a watershed that's about four hours north of San Francisco. Um, and two of the creeks that I'm studying are Elder Creek and Fox Creek. Um, and these are both tributaries to the South Fork. Elder Creek is about 16.7 square kilometers in drainage area, and Fox Creek is um, 2.7. Um, and I'll be focusing for most of, my, most of my presentation today on Elder Creek, which is the larger and more complex watershed. And one thing that's really interesting about these tributaries is they're small watersheds, and they're also quite steep. And that means that they can be characterized by 
a series of waterfalls from the mouth of the creek moving all the way upstream. And as you might imagine, these waterfalls can be barriers to adult steelhead who are swimming upstream to spawn in those creeks. Um, but what's interesting about these waterfalls and these tributaries is that they are partial barriers, meaning that they are passable, but only under some hydrologic conditions. So if, the rain, if there's enough rainfall and enough stream flow, and then a lot of these waterfalls are passable for adult steelhead. But as I mentioned, there's quite a few of these partial barriers, and together they might impede steelhead movement, movement upstream. Um, so this has led me to a couple of twist, testable questions about how do waterfalls and hydrology interact to influence the longitudinal distribution of resident versus migratory life histories in these streams. Um, and of course in California we experience this Mediterranean climate, which means there's a huge interannual variation in the timing and magnitude of precipitation that we get in a given year. Um, and broadly, I'll think, be thinking about those as either a dry year we re where we receive um, little rainfall and then wet years where we receive um, much more rainfall. Um, and here I'm thinking about how the effect of these partial barriers on the upstream movement of the adult steelhead in the wet versus the dry years. Um, and you would expect that in a wet year, there's more opportunity for passage at each of these partial barriers. And that would mean that you would find those migratory fish and consequently the migratory genotypes throughout the watershed, so further upstream than you would um, in a dry year where each partial barrier has a greater effect or is a greater barrier to migration. Um, and perhaps in a dry year, you only find migratory genotypes are concentrated further downstream below the barriers. Um, so today I'm going to present some preliminary data and focus mostly on one waterfall in Elder Creek, and this is the largest waterfall. It's three meters from bedrock to crest, and it's about two kilometers upstream in Elder. So here's the mouth, but the mouth, and then moving downstream to Elder Creek. Um, and so just to give you a taste of the interannual variation and how possible these waterfalls can be, um, a previous fish biologist, Bill Trush, did some observations at this particular waterfall and estimated that steelhead can ascend this waterfall in between 60 and 170 CFS. And then comparing that to historical hydrologic data, um, I estimated that the waterfall was possible from zero to 78 days in a given year. So that's a huge amount of variation. In a given year, it could never be possible or it could be possible for 78 days. Um, and so on the right, you see an elder flow duration curve and you can see it's a pretty narrow window in which this waterfall is possible. And then on the left is a time series of pictures taken at this waterfall and you can see the waterfall filling up with water and becoming possible. Uh, most steelhead ascend through that chute on the left and then the waterfall is dropping again and becoming impassable. Um, so here I'm really interested in the effect of these partial barriers um, that are passable in only some conditions. Um, so to answer this question, I have sampled fish from the mouth to the upper extent of fish, so longitudinally in, in both Elder and Fox Creek. Again, today I'll just be presenting results from Fox Creek. Um, and I've captured fish in about 20% of the pools, which were mapped and then chosen a priori at random. Um, and I conducted three pass electrofishing with each pool unit blocked off with block nets. Um, and then I've taken those samples and I've sequenced them using rag capture methods here at UC Davis um, with Michael Miller. Um, and today I'm going to focus um, but the region of, that I'm really interested in is OMI-5, which is a re region of genome that we know is linked to life history diversity in Omicus. And I'm going to present results from 10 single nucleotide polymorphisms um, uh, that we know were on OMI-5 and from fish that were captured in 2014, which was um, a relatively dry year. Um, so here I've grouped these genotype frequencies into regions of the stream. As I said, I meant I sampled in a pool-by-pool -pool way, but just for today I've grouped this as above versus below that main waterfall in Elder Creek. Um, and so you can see pie charts off there to the left, and the different colors are the different um, genotypes. So blue for migratory, orange for resident, and gray for heterozygous. And you can see 
that below the waterfall is about 30% resident and 30% migratory fish. And then as you move immediately above the waterfall, you can see the proportion of those migratory genotypes decrease, which is exactly what you would expect. Um, and I'm not, I don't have the data up here, but this pattern continues throughout the rest of the watershed in both um, two of the tributaries, this tributary and that tributary. We also see an increasing proportion of resident genotypes as you move upstream. Um, so the next question is, what are the consequences for stream ecology? Um, what are the effects of stream ecology um, did that are related to this zonation of migratory and resonant fish above and below this waterfall? And today I'm going to show you some results about how, these, how this could affect the density of fish. Um, so while I was collecting those tissue samples, I was also estimating density. So every pool, I have an estimate for the number of individuals in the pool and then also estimated the volume of water that was sampled. Um, and so here is a plot of density in Elder Creek. And on the x-axis, we have distance from the mouth. So you can see at the mouth right here and then moving further upstream. And each of these dots is a single pool that was sampled. And then on the y-axis, we have the density of individuals, which is um, fish per meter cubed. And hopefully what's popping out to you already is that below the waterfall, we're finding many, many more fish. So this is about three fish per meter cubed. And then as you move above the waterfall, the number of fish dramatically decreases. Um, and this black tick on the X waterfall is on the X axis is the location of the waterfall. Um, so it seems like this, we're seeing pretty divergent densities below and above the waterfall that are related to these differences in genotype frequencies. Um, and in addition to differences in density, it's not only the differences in the number of fish, but there's also differences in the size structure. So below the waterfall, most of the fish that we're sampling are comprised of these young of the year fish. So these are all fish that are below eight centimeters. Um, and it's mostly that age class, um, which makes sense if you can think of the density as a result of the number of fecund migratory adults who laid their eggs in that reach of the stream. And then above the waterfall, we're seeing a different size structure. Um, and we can see a long tail to the right of this histogram. And those are the age one, two, three, and four fish, or the resident fish that are remaining in that creek for a longer period of time. Um, and thinking, thinking further about what the effects of this is on stream ecology, um, this is, could essentially be adding another trophic level because you're increasing the number of large predatory fish in a system, whereas below the waterfall, you're seeing many more fish, but they're all of the same size and potentially feeding lower on the food web. Um, and just to show you a picture of what this looks like, this, these are examples of fish that were caught in one pool below the waterfall. You can see many of those young of the year, the small fish. And then moving above the waterfall, just as, as an example pool, we're seeing fewer fish, but most of them are these larger fish that are age one and older. Um, so in conclusions, we think that, I think that these small, wa small waterfalls, um, even though there are partial barriers, they can still influence the spatial zonation of migratory and resonant life histories. Um, and second, that these changes in the spatial location of each life history can have implications for um, the density on the size structure of the top predator and the most abundant fish in those creeks, um, which might have some implications for extreme food webs. Um, and then more broadly for partial migration, we often think, as I mentioned at the beginning, we think of partial migration as being really related to um, biotic trade-offs in predation risk and growth and fecundity, but, we, but it's also important to think about geographical features that can influence where we find resident versus migratory individuals in space. Um, and that partial migration can also have consequences for ecological variables, not only for the transfer of nutrients between ecosystems, but also within the resident habitat. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thanks to many collaborators and hardworking graduate and undergraduate students who helped me out and um, funding sources and take any questions.
I know that there has been speculation on what drought does to the human genome through epigenetics. There's a lot of articles out there on that, and I just wondered if there was any uh, implications that you would speculated on the thought about. Yeah, well, so the, it's worth mentioning that the markers that I'm using we know are strongly related to life history diversity, but it's not, um, it's not a gene that definitely controls life history. It's just a region of the genome that we know is closely linked to life history diversity, and so we don't know how closely that's linked to the actual expression of migration or not, especially in these partially migratory populations. So it's possible that the influence of this genotype depends on the hydrologic conditions of that year and that in some years environmental variation might be more important than others in determining um, an, indiv an individual's decision to migrate or not. Yeah. Have you thought at all about if you... Thank you. Have you thought, of, thought of all about if you have, like, establishing, like, a ratio of population that's upstream and downstream of each partial barrier based on water year? Like, kind of thinking from the management perspective? Does that make any sense? Yeah. I haven't thought about doing that, but I think I could with the data that I have and that 